Good afternoon and welcome to today's session where we'll be discussing neurodiversity and economics. I am Marilyn Swinney from Principal Global Investors, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have with me three incredible panelists. Kit Jukes, Senior Economist at SOCGEN, Dr. Amanda Rostoff, Head of Research at Autistica, and Dr. Nazia Habib. And she's the Head of the Centre of Resilience and Sustainable Development at University of Cambridge. We we definitely want a session to be as interactive and uh, a live discussion as possible. So we invite your engagement via the Q&A chat or chat function. Um, and you can really just give your feedback you know, as the speaker speaks throughout the sessions. We really want to try and capture that. And the team and I will be monitoring this and fielding your questions and feedback as appropriate to the various panelists. I'll be setting the scene and then I'll be introducing each speaker and they'll be giving their background and really setting out their stalls, as it were, on this subject. Now, dear audience, with your help, this could be a really interesting afternoon of discussions. Human capital, a component of economic growth, has never been in more acute focus in these unprecedented times. The World Bank, by its human capital project, has been following aspects of human capital development for a long time via the Human Capital Index, the HCI. Now, interestingly, shocks from the COVID-19 pandemic has really revealed the fragility of losing decades of human capital gains. And the 2020 HCI also recognizes the growing skills gaps for babies born during the pandemic to their employable or labor participation age in order to build resilience in economic growth in arguably accelerating digital economies. Now, one aspect of the report suggests um, empowering marginalized uh, segments of the population and where data intensive technologies, including data analytics and data led decision making can actually be transformational when we're thinking about being able to build back better. Neurodiversity, the diversity of human brains and minds recognizes that there is no one correct way of experiencing the world. There is growing recognition that the specific skills match of the neurodiverse community, for example, autistic individuals, to a data-led world is totally warranted. And we really want to explore whether or not there's a way to move the dial here and how and why this should be an investment now. Kit, I'd like to move over to you first. In your long career as an economist, and certainly with your background as well, how have you been seeing the changes in labor participation and also the broader aspects of economic inclusion? Um, I think there's a couple of, of things there and, and you know, at, at a broad picture, which you, which you see completely separate from any individual part of neural diversity, if you like. One is that um, more and more people drop out of the labor market over time tend to because they get sort of they, they don't fit into it properly so so we measure people as employed we measure the labor force um, so we have unemployed people employed people a labor force and then we have people who aren't in the labor force and we forget and then on the labor force because they're not looking for a job uh, because maybe they don't qualify for um, unemployment benefit in one country or another uh, and they just kind of drop through the kind of gaps and and um, these are big numbers of people. So, uh, so the first thing you realize is that um, you, you need to be more inclusive to do that. And we can talk about it around a lot of bits of it, but you see it in terms of how people are employed and you see it through education. You see it and so you can see how it, it happened. I was very struck uh, last year, I guess, but just what would be at the beginning of the pandemic, when Jay Powell, the U.S. Um, president of the Federal Reserve, so the head of the central bank, who's not an academic economist, started talking about this idea of maximum employment. And he was really saying, um, if we if if we keep going while there's no inflation and keep the economy, let it grow hot. Don't have this idea that there's a 
um, an unemployment rate above which, below which the inflation rate will pick up and we have to slow the economy down. That if we run it hot and seek maximum, we will encourage all the people who've left out by society back into the labor market. And that from the top down should be our should be our commitment. And I thought that was very brave for someone who was going to, you know, throw this out. They had a bunch of very serious monetarist economists who are going to look at this and say, yes, but the Phillips curve or, or something like that. Um, and, and, and I think that's a that's a place to start is if you want to get um, if you want to get people into the lane, you, you can't be slamming the brakes on the whole thing. You, you know, you have to do bottom up and top down strategies to encourage it. Oh, that's a really great thought, Kit. And Dr. Amanda, coming over to you. Now, I know you've got a psychology background and you you, you know you have a, a lot of research background in this. And just, just wanted to hear your thoughts really in terms of how that might shape the opportunities to are seeing in terms of supporting that higher labor participation from, for example, the neurodiverse community. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, so I, I'll start with, I guess, just a, a little bit of background as to what how we define neurodiversity. And often when I speak to people, in fact, I've had several conversations this week where people still refer to either autism or ADHD or other neurodiverse conditions as childhood conditions. Um, then there's several mis misconceptions that people grow out of those conditions or, or that it's perhaps um, more of this mythical uh, a behavioral experience than, than, than something that somebody stays with a person across their lifespan. So neurodiversity, and this includes people on the autism spectrum, is differences in ways of thinking. Uh, and that means that it varies uh, from different or non-linear ways of communication and processing information to mild and moderate learning difficulties to profound and multiple intellectual disability. So the implications for how a person can participate in, in the community, in educational attainment and in employment opportunities vary so much depending on where on the spectrum their strengths and needs lie. Every person is different in the way in which they experience and process the world and respond to the world varies not only between individuals um, in terms of neurodiversity more broadly, but also within the same person, depending on the context. And there are so many personal and environmental factors that can be either barriers or facilitators to participation in education and in employment and in life. Um, so it's really important that we uh, support life course changes not only looking at uh, pathways to employment from, uh, from school years into first jobs, but what happens after that point. An autistic or otherwise neurodiverse child becomes an autistic or neurodiverse adult and an older adult. Broadly, the strengths and difficulties that a person experiences are sustained across their lifespan. And this means that we need lifelong strategies for inclusion and appropriate supports for people uh, in, in various scenarios. That doesn't need to be a scary thing and it doesn't need to be complex and messy and it doesn't need to be something we shy away from. And I'll hopefully come to speak to that point a little bit later. There are so many opportunities for why we should embrace neurodiversity. Um, yes, there are complexities in uh, in co-occurring health conditions, and that has implications for how somebody takes part in employment. It uh, has implications for the employer and how they're able to maximize the potential of a person and maximize, uh, speaking of human capital that you mentioned earlier, maximize the opportunities to grow that human capital. So Currently, the rate of employment for autistic people, for example, is around 29%. So that means that that's, that's a 0.3 on the human capital index. That's, that is astonishingly poor, uh, and yet it's the highest that it's ever been. Even worse than that, autism as a neurodiverse group are among the bottom three of all other disabled groups in terms of rates of employment. And given that there is so much breadth and 
uh, and variability within the, the uh, autistic spectrum in terms of strengths and skills that people have, it really raises the question as to why we're, we have a situation where in neurodiverse and where autistic people are not being included in the labour force. So although intellectual disability can occur, it's, it's between 30 and 50% of autistic people can have a varying degrees of intellectual disability. That shouldn't be a deal breaker for opportunities to participate in employment because there are still uh, and a, a range of skills and strengths that somebody brings in the ways in which they think. So non-linear thinking is, um, is an advantage. It can be a competitive advantage. Uh, there are some companies who are thought leaders in this area to be able to harness neurodiverse potential, to be able to change the way not only uh, that they run their organizations, but uh, to be able to embrace the neurodiversity that exists in all people and in across their employer for um, their labor force. That also means that when we're working with our customers or in consumers or with other organizations and partners, that embracing that neurodiverse potential and ways of thinking means that we can connect with other organizations, with our customers that we're not reaching um, because we're exclusive and um, linear in our ways of thinking. So, so that's just one way of, of, of thinking around it. Um, so as the head of research at Autistica, we have um, a, a range of goals. And one of those goals is to double the rate of employment for autistic people by 2030. It's something that we're actively working on. I know that there are other organizations, for example, um, the, the Group for Autism Insurance and Neurodiversity, uh, GAIN, um, who I, I, whose work I also support um, very much, are championing this initiative to make employment more neurodiverse accessible, right from employment readiness all the way through to retirement planning. These are important things for us to think about. I know that ESG is, is a topic that comes up quite a lot and that much of the focus right now is on, is on the environment and climate change. But that shouldn't be to the exclusion of dealing with the societal issues and dealing with um, how we can maximise potential, how in inclusion and diversity is about more than installing two women's toilets and saying that we're gender neutral. Uh, that's it, it's, it goes way beyond that. Inclusion is about meeting people where they are and it's about authentically, authentically making practical adaptations to support participation opportunities for everyone to take part in health services, in education and employment to achieve their maximum potential. Oh, you've led me so nicely, Dr. Amanda. Speaking of ESG, I mean, this is really topical right now. And Dr. Nazi, I want to come over to you. You know, certainly with your work um, at Cambridge University and the social sciences, would you share your background as well on this and some of, perhaps some of the work that you're doing uh, with sort of developing countries? I know that you've done quite a bit there. Where you think really, you know, that there's possibly less awareness of neurodivergent individual potential. And yet, if you think about it, they have more to gain in terms of their economies for maximizing the potential of this group. You know, what needs to be done there, Natasha? Great. Well, thank you so much, Marilyn, uh, for inviting me into this conversation because it is really <clears throat> a fascinating conversation that. Uh, I started to have when I myself was having difficulty to fit in. Um, and it is something that comes uh, from the word stereotype. And I think the work of the way I have started to think about this without being an academic in this space is that what is the what is stereotype and how does stereotypes actually create threats or opportunities for a certain group of the members within the society? So the academic definition of stereotypes is really is a socially constructed shortcut to certain characteristics, attributes, and behaviors of members of the society. So we can go beyond the belief about other people and have a quick understanding what is it that 
a certain group of people are uh, pulled together as common entities. In other words, it basically helps us as human beings in our brain to process wide variety of information about individuals and help us to actually communicate with them. Now, there are both positive and negatives of using stereotypes as a way to connect with people. So, for example, given the way I look, where I come from, there are certain level of stereotypes, people of my age, race, and the country background. If you connect with me on the way I look at, it certainly will create an entertaining conversation because you will be probably familiar with South Asia, a lot of interesting food, a lot of interesting cultural things. Beyond that, there is me as an individual who has a certain type of characteristic that are not similar to the other Bengalis in the, flow, in the uh, world that you have met in. So there the stereotype is a disadvantage because you perhaps won't be able to connect with me if you are not able to understand my characteristic and attributes of how I as an individual operate. This is a very important social understanding of where neurodiversity awareness have dis disconnected itself from the world of employment. Now, of course, with ESG, everybody is now talking more about the social variables and neurodiversity is more and more coming up as a way to improve the score for the organizations who are looking to get a star mark on neurodiversity. But it's not good enough to use a stereotype again by creating neurodiversity as a way to advance into that space. And a good, a good example of that is that creating a neurodiversity, and I'll take a bit of a critical view here, is the, within the work of uh, human capital and, and, and discourse around accessibility. By creating a category of neurodiversity, yes, there are a lot of data points that are getting companies to be excited to say, look, uh, Forstress have identified that companies with neurodiverse population can have up to 20% of net return on their investment. Why not invest on neurodiversity? But at the same time, there are researchers who are collecting case studies from top organizations, including Goldman Sachs, Microsoft, Google, where they are finding that neurodiversity is actually creating pigeonholing of individual into a task that could be quite um, unattractive for the rest of the population within the company. They are also finding that their poor performance, lower pay, and more less complex roles are actually making them less attractive for a career progression. Simply because we are now going behind the scene of stereotype of creating an opportunity case study for neurodiversity, but haven't really worked out the whole value chain, the whole human value chain that we need to walk into the, uh, into the employment space. And that leads me to challenge those um, organizations to think more critically as to what are the variables, what are the matrix, what are the uh, real career progression growth strategy they need to put together before they even bring in someone into the employment uh, space and say that we have scored a number. So in other words, the research that we have done in the past on inequality, the learning that we have from developing countries working on women and children getting inclusive into the social benefit has a lot to tell how neurodiversity could be the next category of human race who needs to have a verifiable and validated space into the workplace. And this is no longer like the example was that uh, Amanda used so cutely is that having a two women's bathroom is not that, gen you know, we're a gender friendly uh, empl uh, employer. And, and, and funny experience from my own recent visit to Harvard, where I have done my postgraduate degree. And that's exactly where I kind of first found out my inability to connect with everyone was that there are uh, uh, non-gender toilets. <laughs> and... <laughs> That was the first time me coming across that tick box exercise that uh, that uh, some countries are very good at doing because those tokenism has only taken us just enough 
just far enough, but not close enough to be completely equal. And you can see that some of the case studies that come out from the corporations in the um, uh, developed uh, world where inequality, uh, diversity are still a major challenge. And hence, uh, I, this talk is actually quite an important one to participate. Um, and thank you again, Marilyn, for the invitation. <laughs> You're most welcome. We're absolutely delighted that you're here. And I, I want to pick up on that a little bit more in terms of, you know, you talked about, um, you know, not going far enough, right? To, uh, tokenism, I think, is, a, is the word that we're using here. And and and, and, I'm, and I know that we, we need to kind of go broader. So, Kits, going back to you, you know, just thinking, bringing it back up to sort of policy level again, you know, if we, if we were to think of something, a successful social system you know how do you think that can be how can how can that be married up to what you know our policy makers economic policy makers when they're pretty distracted most of the time and focusing elsewhere i i guess there are there are three things and 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 you can put them all into policy right that's what some of them come from what nazi is saying so the, the there's there's the exercise of saying you, you need to identify this early because you affect it through all of people's careers lives um, secondly, you need to get on a soapbox and explain why it's a good thing. Um, and then I think, um, thirdly, you need the, this idea I started at the beginning of, you need to give the economy a chance to happen, which means um, running, it, running it pretty hot uh, at various points. And, and that, I think, does, um, does matter. So, so taking taking each of those sort of one by one, really, uh, you know, the, the first piece that really jumps out at me is, I think you need to have policymakers jump on on top of the idea that um, the economy is a much better place if we have a more diverse labor force um, in it. So you know, and the middle the middle class kind of cliche is, you know, a rugby team's got big people, small people, tall people, fast people, uh, and if you didn't have all that variety, you'd lose everything. And, and I think that's, um, and I think that's, um, uh, you know, something that. Um, oh, apologies, we might have lost it. Yeah, there you go. Not to worry, I think maybe we'll just wait until he gets back. But I wanted to go back. Uh, to you, Nazia, uh, if that, if I may, um, and and really, you know, it, it just sounds here like we're looking at you know a, a particular situation, you know, and and I know that uh, from your background, you know, you do apply a lot of systems based thinking. So if you're thinking of a corporate entity trying to, or or even a government, you know, policymakers, how can you apply this type of systems based thinking to really approach the situation? And you know how do we how do we measure progress as well to get the right social outcomes so, so that you know then we can continue to establish where we're going. Great question, thank you. Um, so as I was saying, we have a lot to learn from what we have achieved in women and children inclusion in the economic policies, and and for this particular group of um, cohort within the human race. The, the lessons that we have not done well is going to give us a lot of insight that what we should do differently this time around. First thing we did not do very well when we started to talk about women and children inclusion during the Millennium Development Gold rollout in the early 2000s was that we did not connect with the uh, top down, bottom up into a space where you have a dual approach. In other words, there were a lot of push from the global international agencies. A lot of developed countries have started to make the claim and calls for inclusion, but there was very little um, uh, um, uh, reception of information bottom up. So in other words, women themselves were not visible into the policy discourse. It wasn't until the sustainable development goals uh, further into the years have started to actually get more into the front row and turn themselves into the policymaker instead of just depending on outsiders. So from a one, one very important learning that I also take in my toolbox when I go and talk with the, uh, with the governments, and, and this year alone we are working with, 30, our research is going to impact 37 countries' uh, public policy on climate finance, 
we are telling them you need to hear from the audience who are going to benefit from the distribution of the finance. Similarly, with the new diversity uh, population, as it is an economics forum where we're talking about the connection of the economic benefits and economic cost, it is the new diversity population who should be in the front row and actually making the decision what is it that they need, what is it that they're willing to let go, because that's where you de-risk the investment into this space, and what is it that they are willing to look forward to so that in the future, your policy becomes also future-proof. So if you can get present to the future, visioning done with the new diversity population themselves, and put it in the context of the economic consideration that these industries, these institutions are out actually paying towards, then you start, start to see that bottom up, top down matchmaking. And within that matchmaking, the governance also appears. And this is the other way we did not do very well in the past. We did not come up with the actual governing factors that matters to make change happen. We went and headcount based. For example, how many children uh, from female um, gender group has attended school? How many uh, women had rights to walk on the street in the night after nine o'clock? Those numbers are headcount numbers, not system level numbers. So if you're going to ask a proper answer to what extent a city has become safe for women to walk at nine o'clock, it's not about the numbers. It's perhaps how many um, reduction of the natural threat that happens against women in nighttime has actually reduced. So you look at a different number, not the number of women on the on the street, because simply you just don't want to be in the street. It's cold winter night in the UK. Uh, has nothing to do with the safety. So you see the interpretation of the data in itself has to be quite context specific. So I would say we need to do a lot more in terms of what what we are excited about and what we should be actually excited about when we think about policy, effective policy making for the neurodiversity population within economics. And I see Kit has joined us back again. Thanks so much, Nazia. Kit, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Do you like to carry on? I think it's uh, I'll, I'll, too I'll relevant in. in what you were to say on the measurement side of things. Um, yeah, I was going to sort of jump into to two pieces. I mean, the first piece was you need to win a battle to get people to understand if you have nothing but one group of middle-aged white men um, in, in a business, you won't make money. And so for the sake of argument, we all have the same opinion about what will or won't happen in a conflict in Ukraine. And none of us is going to be right if we don't talk to people who have a different perspective because we don't understand anybody else. Uh, and if you're in a hedge fund or an investment firm or a bank, that's really expensive. So you have to win that that battle of minds to tell people to say, you know, we need to get a more diverse group of people working here. We need more women. We need more more age groups. We need um, just a whole different mindset about it. That, that's the first piece. Then, then the second piece I think that comes through from it says, well, how do you do that once I've you know convinced convinced myself? And I think it starts early. And one of the things I feel strongly about personal level is, you know. We live in a world where we're really good at counting stuff that's easy to count. So computers count everything, and they're great. But if you can't, if you can't have somebody to count, you can't do anything. Um, so if you if you wanted to post a job in, in in a firm today, you post it up on the internet. You can have uh, you know a hundred thousand identical sort of covering letters and CVs sent to you back from people who've been you know have, have learned how to do it, and, and they're they're quite similar, and they've all come through universities where um, a lot of people were very, had very similar uh, personal statements and, and all got fantastic grades to get there. And they're all quite similar. And if I go back, you know, even further, I mean, certainly I really started thinking about it when my son dropped out of conventional school because the, go the government was setting targets on reading and writing and insisting on key, key stage one tests the age. Um, my, my son, who's dyslexic and autistic, <laughs> didn't learn easily to write, which it won't be a big shock. Um, and so he was given tests on writing you know, by a teacher because the government needed them when he couldn't write. So he threw a pencil at a teacher and got thrown out of school. And you sit there and say, well, of course, in a busy classroom, the teacher is going to put the, the child who's a little bit difficult um, in a corner to play with a computer. And so, you know, 15 years later, he'll be a computer scientist um, doing that instead but but 
But if you so you if your education system is going to be sort of force feeding you to have big classes that produce identical children um, heading off at university, if the whole structure of the focus is that, then anybody who isn't smack in the middle, the median of a of a population it is automatically at a disadvantage. Um, and by the time I see their CD, CVs, I, I can't, I, I just can't get the people that I need to create diversity. It's, it's almost impossible. So you make it, you, you've, got to, you've got to sort of look all the way through. And I thought this was where Nadia's point was so clear. If, if you're just trying to sort of go for tokenism, you have no chance. You have to, you have to from a policy sense, say, this will make us more successful. We need yeah. to rethink the plumbing. And then for the rest of us, for people like me, it's to turn around and say, look, it's good policy. I mean, at, at a bare minimum, gradually having more and more people marginalized in society on benefits of one kind or another is going to cost you a fortune. And to convince employers that a diverse labor force will make your labor force Vastly, but not vastly, but not just by turning around and saying, "Well, you know, autistic people are good at at, uh, at doing some certain kind of repetitive tasks." Let's put them in a corner. You know, we all know the most famous autistic person was Winston Churchill, and what he was good at was not losing wars. So, you know, the the, the, the there's there's a sort of a piece in there where you have to turn around and say, having interesting people made welcome in workplaces makes them better places. Oh, amazing. And and this is a great time, um, Dr. Amanda, to bring you in and also answer one of the questions that's been asked about, you know, looking at the characteristics and what about the benefit? Thank you, John, for asking this question. And why not talk about the benefit of employers of autistic investment analysts? Their concentration enables them to produce better research. Now, Dr. Amanda, would you like to take that one in terms of the character characteristics of community yeah absolutely and and yes thank you john again for that point and um so in embracing neurodiversity and for instance uh, specifically autistic ways of thinking and being in the labor force has so many advantages it's not about uh, ticking a neurodiverse aware or, or disability aware box it's about being a thought leader so for instance um, non-linear ways of thinking strength in pattern recognition or hyper focusing uh, is something that came up in, in john's point can be major advantages so think of how this could for example be of benefit as an as an autistic investment analyst or a trademark legal analyst to improve the quality of work in your particular organization. If you're wondering why we should even consider a business case for neurodiversity and inclusion, and this speaks to both Nazia and Kit's points from earlier, Neurodiversity inclusion has wide reaching imp um, impacts for health and well being, not only of the neurodiverse group that are included in the workforce, but it makes for a healthier and happier workforce across the organization. So, this is why, as I mentioned earlier, we at Autistica have at the heart. Um, uh, inclusion in our 2030 goals to double the rate of employment for autistic and other neurodiverse groups by 2030, um, but also to have evidence-based solutions for how we can improve the lives of autistic people across the lifespan. So I'll add that the current cost of underemployment as well as unemployment, which is around 11.5 billion pounds, billion pounds a year, um, this is for uh, neurodiverse groups overall. This in turn is impacted by increased uh, care costs and support needs, um, poorer mental health, which also has an impact on poorer physical health and reduced opportunities to the, the, the compounding effect of reduced opportunities to participate. So in turn, that leads to early mortality. But add to that the impact on uh, reduced family income where the supports fall onto family members who then in turn are not able to participate in the workforce because of increased care and support needs. And because of exclusion, um, we are then limiting a, a much wider group of people from uh, opportunities to participate and maximizing their own potential. Imagine if we could measure change in a meaningful way and uh, a way of measuring progress beyond profit. 
If we measure change by changing policy and we measure change by practice, if we me measure change by improving lives, it's change that de-risks neurodiversity inclusion. The business case for investing in relatively minor adaptations to make recruitment processes, in-work adjustments, and long-term career, career progression and retirement planning more inclusive and accessible, not only reduces or near eradicates those costs, but has increased benefits of a healthier, happier, and more productive workforce across the board. Think, for example, fewer sick days, employees who actually want to stay with the organization and grow with the organization, who champion the way in which the organization's products and services are shaped and led and delivered. You've probably all heard the saying that uh, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago or even five years ago, and the next best time is today. And now is the time for change. It's for embracing complexity, not shying away from it because it might be messy or inconvenient. In essence, that's the exemplar of uh, that's the exemplar of privilege. Uh, and it's it's also an, exa an example of otherness and exclusion. Today is about thought leadership. It's about championing truly inclusive practice and about moving the dial to make sustained and meaningful progress. Today's the day to start change by small but significant practical and evidence-based adaptations that embrace and engage a neurodiverse workforce from employment readiness all the way through to retirement planning to maximize individual and societal potential to build strong organizational cultures uh, to provide safe and inclusive environments for neurodiverse divergent people to thrive to achieve their maximum potential and to live rewarding and fulfilling lives and also more broadly to maximize human capital potential oh that that sums it up doesn't it i mean it uh, it, it really is. And I've really re enjoyed the discussion looking at sort of from a top down, but also bottom up in terms of the responsibilities we all have. Um, I was quite intrigued by one of the, for a few of you, of course, Dr. Nazia and um, Dr. Mandy, you've both mentioned about making things more accessible, making it more friendly. And, and again, we were, when we were talk talking about measurement, you know, not, not using the wrong data, you know, instead of instead of measuring progress this way, why don't you think about policy and making workplace more accessible, the adjustments more accessible, you know, so that the building is autistic friendly, for example, you know, you know, and, and, and these changes are not huge. Uh, Kit, did you want to come back on anything in, in particular um, on, on that discussion as well? I think, you know, bringing it back from it, uh, to the economic discussion that we started out with as well. I think that I think a lot of it is is it's getting this balance between understanding the bottom up and understanding the, the understanding works that uh, and, and getting and getting the message across that it doesn't work if you're tokenist about it. you have to change you have to change it and 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 perhaps most importantly now is when we can change the way people interact at work I mean we're not interacting the way we usually do we are not down the pub in the city right now it's sort of you know we're not in a you know in a cfa event somewhere in somewhere in the city uh, it's different so 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 once you've embraced the idea that you let people work two three days a week from home or or you know come in and do various things and you start realizing that we've got to make it we've, we've got to we've got to adjust and 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 grab the responsibility for for change then uh, then i think it's very important it you know in, in the neurodiverse community to push to push the changes that'll really make a difference which is yeah you know we don't we don't need to sit in great big halls in lines and lines of desks with lots and lots of noise um, in, in a world where everybody's talking into a computer headset really you know kind of you know we we, we need uh, we need to move more we need to wander around we need to stop talking about the idea that the working day is nine to five all all of those things i think are clearly understood just below the surface uh, at the same time as various people say everyone needs to be back in the office or no one in their right mind should ever go back to the office uh, failing to understand that everyone is actually genuinely different but when you do that the opportunity 
to make things more friendly is huge. And the cost is tiny because we're doing it anyway. We, we are absolutely going to change what offices look like and what the work day looks like. So, so make it, you know, make it work for people who have been excluded all the time. <laughs> And, and, mm. and I think that's where, really where it, where it comes back to. And, and say, and, and, then, and then figure out what it is we're trying to measure. You know, that, that, I mean, I think, that, I think this measurement piece to me is if we measure the wrong things, we will always make the wrong decisions. And Dr. Nazir, do you have any, anything else you'd like to add um, you know, from, from your experience as well and what we've been talking about today? Uh, now, as I as I appear in the camera with a smile, I really like the validation that Kit and Amanda did, <laughs> because as a policy um, advisor and an academic in public policy space, this is a struggle for us to even convince um, uh, those who are collecting the data is that why they are collecting a data and why a new data set should be collected. Um, it's very expensive uh, data collection, and there is also my uh, Thought is that we make it expensive because we have created a glamour around data collection process. And I think part of the challenge where we are kind of stuck in our existing pathway is that like glamour working in Wall Street, working in London stuff, you know, in the finance industry, that has certain number on the market when you talk about the data points. So as a societal challenge, I think we should all make data more uh, freely accessible and freely um, collected, um, but unfortunately, with nonlinear thinking, with GDPR and everything coming down the pipeline, we're not making it easier. Um, we're only making it a little bit more complicated than sometimes we should. So, this whole measurement point is really a a a topic that needs to be investigated by each and everyone who are in the business of creating data. Um, it is something that we should all get very deep uh, training on to ask the right question and then go back to collect the data. So we don't continue to collect the same data for the sake of creating a trend. And trend doesn't really say anything if you don't know what you're measuring. So, so, so I'll, I'll, you, I'll be a little bit more critical um, before we champion even um, let's change the data sets. Is that let's champion the pricing of the data sets uh, because that will enable researchers and practitioners to do a better job. So that'll be my parting words. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, you know, just to sum up, I guess we, we, we're going back, uh, you know, the, and to how we started when we just we had this discussion. I've, I've really enjoyed um, this panel and thank you so much for all your contribution, Kit, Dr. Amanda and Dr. Nazia. It, you know, we started with a problem, right? There, there is a problem. You know, the HCI index from most the past human capital gains that are really now, uh, you know, as the pandemic continues, um, you know, 10, 10 decades is, is not something, it's not a small number of, of loss in capital, uh, human capital gains. And then, you know, looking forward, the children born in the pandemic and, 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 and that the you know you, you you can't it's not a linear equation here right we need a slightly different solution in terms of thinking how we can build back and one of these suggestions is really to look at that marginalized part of the population and and that's how we got on to looking at the specific skill sets that the neurodiversity community can bring and we really talked about how do we make the the place you know from a policy perspective being having policyholders with the courage to run the economy hot so that gives the it's like it gives the actual atmosphere and opportunity for that higher maximum labor participation and on the other hand looking to the corporates looking to individuals you know, the neurodiverse population stepping up and and saying what do they need thinking of the future being part of that discussion and being being given a chance to have a voice and, and I love the work that you're doing also, Dr. Amanda, you know, in terms of the targets uh, for organizations like Autistica, you know, um, putting it out there and wanting to double the rate of employment from arguably an incredibly low base um, of 29%, but, you know, to double it to in 2030. So I really look forward to further discussions. You know, this is not this is only the start, I hope, for everyone, certainly for the community listening. We want to get that engagement. We want to get your participation. Um, and there are 
organizations, uh, including charity organizations that you can reach out to and, and also the CFA UK uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, society as well can help field some of these sort of thoughts and, and galvanize community. But I, I really do feel quite good about the fact that we are slowly building a community and building a voice. And I think from that, to your point, Dr. Nazir, we can start somewhere in terms of how we design those systems. How do we design that corporates can behave in a particular way and create meaningful change? So Really, thank you so much, everyone, for dialing in, those who've dialed in. For those who've picked up this recording, thank you again for listening to us. And we really wish you uh, a really good session for the next piece and look forward to catching up again. Thank you.